Hey guys, in this lecture, I wanna talk about welding rods or electrodes, whatever you wanna call them. Kind of why they're so important, why they're relevant, how to use them, things like that. So let's go ahead and get started. And let's talk about those objectives. Our objectives are rod specification, meaning the numbers on the side. What are they used for? Rod sizing and rod storage. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk about what the actual welding rod is. Now we've already talked about the science behind stick welding, how the electrode holder and the ground clamp are hooked to your base metal, strike the arc and start welding. You know, this is your fill in metal. This is also the, the outer flux is what causes that um, gaseous cloud to cover your weld. So that way that no oxygen and water or any contaminants can get inside there, ruining that weld. <clears throat> so what, so, but what is, what is here really? I mean, it's just a metal rod. Metal rods come in multiple different sizes. This one right here is an eighth inch. They also come in 16th inch, 330 seconds, eighth inch, 530 seconds, 316 with that 330 seconds, eighth inch, that is the most popular sizes of welding rods that people will use. Um, very rarely do they bump up to a, a larger one anymore. Typically the larger ones were meant for if you were doing any production work or anything like that. And that, that's kind of gone away. Stick welding is more used for doing those one-off things, working out in the field, pipelines, big time structural welding, way up in the air, things like that. Still very valuable, but we're kind of going away from manufacturing and a lot more into repair or construction. So there's two main types of welding rods out there, um, 6010, 7018. Those are the most popular ones. And I would say about 95 to 98% of America welds with those rods in some way or another, whether that's they're, they're required to use that rod or that's the one they grabbed off the shelf and they just use. So I'll talk about different styles of welding rods out there and I'll kind of explain what the numbers are. But for the most part, I'm just gonna talk about these two welding rods because chances are very slim that you're gonna need anything else. So let's start with the 7018 rod. So if we look at it, you can see Excalibur 7018H4R, all right? We're gonna talk about what those numbers mean in a minute, but <clears throat> 7018 is kind of that all around welding rod. And it is by far the most popular of the two that I said I was gonna talk about. It's mainly used for structural welding, pipelines. If you're gonna go walk around and look at welds, you're gonna probably see 7018 welds. Okay, so the second rod is 6010. Let me show that really quick to you. 6010 is really popular with doing some of the projects like pressure vessels, open route type stuff. It is, and it's very popular on farms. It's actually coined the farm rod. So the reason it's really popular for doing um, pressure vessels is because they can do that open route weld that they're typically required to do. Pipe welding, pressure vessel, kind of the same thing. So you could take this welding rod and you could be welding that open route. It's considered a fast freeze electrode. So what that means is you're welding and the puddle is cooling ultra fast compared to some of the other welding rods out there. It's also really popular on the farm because you can weld through some pretty nasty stuff, such as like rust, even paint. I mean, I'm not suggesting you weld through paint, but uh, it could do it and it can get you by. It can also uh, even weld through some light water. So be very careful with that. I, I would again, not suggest welding through water. It can be very dangerous, but this can weld through some light moisture. So now I wanna talk about welding rod specification. So it's gonna be the numbers on the side of the welding rod. One thing that I wanna point out is this H4R. Not every welding rod has an H4R at the end of it. H4R, we're gonna get there in a second. But what I wanna start with is the 7018 because every uh, welding electrode will have a number that is like this one, okay? First thing I wanna point out is gonna be the E. E stands for electrode. Now you're not always gonna see that E written on any um, actual welding rod. More than likely, if you're going to order a welding rod or you're reading a textbook, if you're just trying to write a service report or something like that, you would put that E in there. Otherwise, it's just a number that somebody who maybe doesn't know a lot of information about it would just look at the number and not know what it stands for, okay? So the E is not always required and you're not always gonna see it, but it does stand for electrode. It's just letting you know it's a welding rod. So the next thing I wanna point out is gonna be this 70 right here. Now, the 70 is gonna indicate tensile strength. It doesn't always have to be a 70. You, just going back to our 6010 that we have talked about earlier and we're gonna talk about again, it's a 60 tensile strength. Tensile strength can be measured from 60 all the way up to 120. 
You just have to dis decide which one that fits your project the best. Most of the time, the engineer will determine this for you. If you had 70 here, it would actually be 70,000 tensile strength. And we'll we're going to make sure that when we're ever, we're ever thinking about this, that we're thinking that it's a lot bigger number than what is actually written there. It's just a, an indicator of that it starts with that 70 or starts with the 120 or something like that. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to the next number. So the next number is a number one. Now, this number one indicates what kind of welding positions you can be welding that specific rod in. Now remember, a welding rod can be welded in flat, horizontal, vertical up, vertical down, and overhead, all right? So we need to know what that rod is capable of, and that's gonna be indicated by this number right here. So one indicates you can weld it flat, horizontal, vertical up, and overhead. Now there's three different types of numbers that are gonna be here. There's going to be a, a one, a two, or a four. So now the two indicates that it is a flat horizontal bead. It can only weld flat and horizontal. So that means flat and then horizontal. This, you see this a lot, there's a 7024 rod that is also popular, but it's got, a, it's got a two in that one location. So it's only a flat and horizontal. Now the four is where it really changes up. This, is, this rod can do all of the positions except for it can't weld vertical up, it can only weld vertical down. It's really important to make sure that you have those very clear in your mind what you're allowed to do with what rod. It's almost never popular to weld vertical down with stick. I actually haven't even seen a lot of number fours in a welding rod specification, but doesn't mean they're not out there and doesn't mean I've seen everything. So the next number is our eight. Let me go ahead and underline that. Eight. So eight stands for what the makeup of that flux co coating actually is. Now this one is a low hydrogen with an iron powder in it. One of the interesting things is you'll hear a lot of the old timers call them low hydrogen rods. Um, and that's just because what that flux is made of. So there's one thing that we can figure out from that eight, and that is what kind of voltage we're gonna be using. It could be AC, it could be DC positive, it can be DC negative. So based off of that number right there, we can figure it out. It also lets us know some of the specifications that we need to be storing that welding rod. We're gonna talk in a minute about putting a welding rod in welding rod ovens and this one might be a really good indicator on whether it needs to go in that oven or not <clears throat> all right now you see i've underlined the h4 and the r as being separate because they mean two totally different things there is some other options you're going to see up here you're going to see an m possibly for military you're going to see a one i've seen a, a dash one quite a bit and that is for an increased strength and ducticity now the h4 stands for diffusible hydrogen parts per million If it's got that, it's just a, it's an added bonus. It doesn't change the 7018. And if you get a welding rod that has something on the end, it doesn't change that the 7018 is still the same welding rod. It might weld a little different, but I haven't even noticed a significant difference. Now the R stands for it's water resistant or moisture resistant, I should say. If you, if you might have multiple things here, but it, again, it doesn't change this information here. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna draw our 6010 up there and I'm going, let's talk about that for a second. Okay, so now I've got the 6010 up here on the board. Let's quickly go through that. So E stands for electrode. Um, again, it's never gonna probably be written on the rod. It's always gonna be in a textbook or when you order something or definitely if you're doing a uh, service report, you should be putting that in. The next thing is our 60. Remember, 60,000 tensile strength. Remember, tensile strength is a pulling force. It's not a pushing or a, a shearing force. It's actually pulling. It's how much force that weld can withstand being pulled apart. And that's pounds per square inch of force. So 60,000 or 70,000, that's quite a lot. Welds are very strong. Moving on to our, uh, our one, remember, it's all uh, what positions we can weld that welding rod in. So this one could be welded in flat, horizontal, vertical up, and then our overhead positions. Remember, two is just gonna be that flat, horizontal, and four will be a flat, horizontal, vertical down, and then overhead, zero. Now, I probably should have said this before, but there's actually nine different possibilities for what that rod flux covering could be made of. 
it's most popular to see a zero or an eight, but there are multiple types. I've got them listed in the notes below. If you are interested and wanna learn more about that, go check it out. There might be some test questions where you wanna use those notes. So zero, so zero is gonna be a cellulose potassium based flux. It's gonna be a lot more volatile. It's gonna be a lot more, more spatter, more, more motion and stuff like that. So just know it's, probably, it's possibly because of this final number. Again, this final number can tell us what kind of welding voltage we need to use and stuff like that. So again, all that stuff should be in the notes. All right, let's go ahead and move on to uh, rod storage now that we're done talking about the specification of welding rods. I wanted to wrap this uh, lecture up just talking about a little bit about rod storage. And what rod storage really comes down to is either our rod oven or the, the welding rod needs to stay inside of the hermetically sealed container that it comes in. So what happens is at the factory when they make those welding rods, they're actually putting them inside that, that metal case and then that is sealed with no moisture inside of there. So if you are gonna be going out and doing a structural weld or a weld that needs to be certified, what you would have to do is either pull it out of that, that steel casing, the, the container, and go weld with it immediately, usually within two hours, or you need to be keeping it and storing it inside of a welding rod. Again, those cases or those packaging, they're hermetically sealed, okay? So let's go ahead and move on to our welding oven. So you can go ahead and we can open ours. It's pretty warm, so try not to touch it too much. So you can see that we're storing all of our rod here in this oven that is required to be in there. I typically have my rod oven set anywhere between 250 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember when I was saying about how to open that case, you have about two hours to weld with it. So what happens is the outer flux on that welding rod can collect moisture. And then when you go to weld with it, that moisture will get into your weld. It's kind of the same thing is true about your welding rod oven. If your welding rod has been out of the case, then you need to get it into your welding rod and it needs to bake in here for a little while. Usually it's about two hours, depending on what degrees you have your uh, rod oven set to or how much welding rods in there or the thickness and size of those welding rods or even the type. So just kind of look into that and make sure that what you're using is correct. What I usually do is I try to bake on my welding rod if it's been outside for a while for about two hours before we weld it or do anything with it. So that concludes our lecture on welding rods. I hope this helps you. If you have any questions or anything you'd like to go over, please snag me, come talk to me. This is something that I did for a long time